Hey listeners, welcome to another season of Cozy Moon Podcast. We have made it to season eight. This season, I want to shine the light on mama's health, aka women's health, and some of these illnesses that I will be discussing with special guests can also affect men, but I really want to focus on what illnesses uh, women go through and deal with and have to make sure their bodies are in check, have to make sure their diet is in check, especially if they want to carry children or carrying children. And, you know, the knowledge of knowing your family history, how important it is for your health and your life. And that's what I wanted to focus on in this season. I hope you guys enjoy all of the guests. We're going worldwide with these guests. I'm talking to women across the water, across the pond, as they call it. I'm talking to women from different walks of life. And I just want you guys to get the information, learn from the information and take that with you and spread it to someone who, you know, needed more insight on what they're going through or what their symptoms are. I hope you guys enjoy Cozy Womb Podcast. Don't forget to hashtag Cozy Womb Podcast. You can find me on Twitter, IG, and Facebook. We are talking fibroids, ladies. It's very important. It's so much information that you need to know, whether it's talking about diet, whether it's talking about what you put in your body as far as birth control, um, medicine that you take, exposure to certain things. It's all information you should know pertaining to your body. And as women... We bring about life, and if fibroids is getting in the way of us bringing about life, that's something we should know more about, right? Right. With today's food being so big on the GMO side and every, uh, you know, well-known company is trying to have its own seed, trying to own its own plant and all of this, what are we eating that is really real? What is in the food that we're eating? What is in Beyond Meats? And it's all about knowing what you're putting into your body, knowing what's good for your body, and knowing what works for you in the best way. So when it comes to fibroids, I reached out and I uh, got in touch with Portia. And she is very knowledgeable about fibroids. I know a few women in my life that have fibroids, battle with fibroids, or fibroids have gotten to a point where it completely changes how they do things or changes their goals and their plans. And I just want women to know what they can do to take care of themselves, to prevent it, to um, find some ease, find some help within the facts or the idea of fibroids. Because it's not the end, but it is an illness that a lot of women deal with. And I think if we're more informed, we can be better when it comes to fibroids. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Hey, hey, it's Anya Dula, and I am the host of Intercultured with Anya Dula. Intercultured with Anya Dula is a podcast that focuses on motherhood, culture, birth work, and travel. And it's just a place for women to come together to discuss our philosophies on motherhood, to discuss our work and birth work, if that's what we do, but mainly to bring women of all different cultures together so that we can talk about how we mother, how we hashtag do motherhood so that we can learn from one another and learn to love each other. That's really what it's all about. I hope you'll join us. Intercultured with Anya Dula podcast is available on all the major podcast stations. I hope you'll join us. Can't wait to connect. lovely guest for you guys. This episode is episode three and we'll focus on fibroids within women's health, uh, more so pertaining to Black women because Black women are um, 
found to have it more or it's been like more extreme in Black women. And I wanted to have Portia here that can, you know, expand the knowledge on fibroids. I know a little bit about it, but I feel like people want to know what fibroids are, can it be prevented, how we can uh, fix the issue. And it's important because if you think about the numbers of Black women that are around in other countries also, it's one in three women can possibly have fibroids. And I think the stigma of women who have fibroids, quote unquote, cannot have children, needs to stop because there are lots of women who have fibroids and have two children, three children, four children. Um, and I just want her to really talk about it. So welcome, Portia. Thank you, glad to be here, glad to be here. So tell us a bit about yourself and what got you into making this page focus on Black women dealing with fibroids. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, Portia, I'm excited to be here and talk about this issue. Uh, I, in 2000, about five, um, my mother um, was diagnosed with fibroids and um, she had to undergo a lot of surgeries and things. That was the first time I was actually made aware of what they were, right? Um, by that time I was out of college and so had never, you know, I was pretty healthy. Um, worked out, that kind of thing. So I had never thought about it. Um, and then several years later, so in 2015, I moved to North Carolina where I live now um, and went to my gynecologist uh, appointment per my huge, and they identified me as having fibroids. Hmm. So it was from that experience, um, I really wanted to learn more about it, uh, trying to figure out what caused them, what triggered them, um, and then how could I rid myself of them and so just really began to try to find out as much as I could about it for myself. And then decided to create Black Girls with Fibroids page on Instagram um, because I just wanted to share my story, right? Just really understanding that a lot of times these issues go untalked about within families, especially in my experience with Black women. Um, and really using it as an outlet to connect with people, to share what I've been experiencing. And not that I have all the answers because I'm not a medical doctor um, by, by no way, but just hoping that it helps other folks um, and to build community in that way. So that's what kind of kicked that off for me. Hmm. So with you finding out that you had fibroids, did you know your mom had it before or you found out after? No, she told me. So I was out of college when, when, I, when we learned that. And so she told me um, and she had, you know, heard about with things and working through with the doctors and it was so there's an awareness there. But mm -hmm. in since 2015, I was found to have had five fibroids between three to five centimeters long. Wow. Um, and yeah, so they were, uh, that was a big number for me, right? Uh, just learning at one time that you have not one, but five of them, um, and how just the diameter, how big they were. Um, mm -hmm. And so at that time, I was on birth control. And when I found out that I had fibroids, I got off birth control immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and I got off because as I began to do my research, I learned that fibroids feed off estrogen. And so, um, all birth control is are doses of estrogen being given to your body, right? Regardless of how you consume them, pill form or um, with a shot, it's just you're giving your body estrogen to regulate things. And I recognize some people need that, right? I have folks that I know with PCOS, um, polyuric ovarian cysts, um, and they need it to regulate periods. But for me, it was just I was taking it as a form of birth control. Um, and really, I figured out that was that that's what's feeding them. That's when they get bigger. I, I cut it off. Um, and so at that moment, I began to say, look, if, okay, so who else is doing the work around this? What are some things? My mom's a naturopathic doctor. And so my whole life has been focused on what are the natural ways of doing things. And so that's what I um, resorted to, was trying to find some natural ways that I could begin ridding myself or shrinking the fibroids um, as best as I could. And so that's, uh, that's what I started doing. That's how I found out about them. Um, and then from there, it's been, it's been trial and error. Um, there are days uh, I get an annual, it just, you know, kind of pap smear, well, woman's exam every year. And sometimes I'm happy with the information. Um, and then sometimes I'm not so happy. So this past year, um, I turned 36, um, uh, not married, no kids, but turned 36 and then found out that my fibroids had grown in size. So I went from having that were three to five centimeters to having, they found four, one being eight centimeters in diameter. And yeah. 
And so, and I only know because I, I'm just, historically I'd never been one to cramp a lot or none of that, but I noticed I started having um, harder cramps, like they were just hurting more. Mm -hmm. um, so when I found out I had an eight centimeter, which is like three inches in diameter, um, and sitting on my uterus, and I'll explain the kind of three types that you can get, um, mm -hmm. that triggered something else in me. I was like, this is not just something I should ignore. Um, even though I think I eat right, I think, you know, I work out, what, what is this and why is this? Um, mm -hmm. So that really kind of spurred me creating the site and me doing more just in-depth research for myself and others. Mm. I'm so glad you took it upon yourself to do your own research, even knowing about fibroids with your mom, you still research it for yourself. I, I have had a few friends who dealt with fibroids, have fibroids, have been told that they need to um, change their diet or um, they should stop, you know, drinking lots of alcohol. Maybe that may help them, you know, conceive better. I've had a friend that had, I think, six of them removed. And um, I don't want women to feel defeated because of fibroids. And when you grow up and you have like cousins who are also female and they have heavier periods and they have periods where they don't even want to go to school or yeah. they don't want to talk to anybody, pain pills don't work. And it's kind of like, what's going on? Because I also have periods, but a pain pill is like a cure for me. You give me a pain pill, some chocolate, and I'm good. But with them, it's on like another level where they don't, they have like huge pads that they wear because it's really heavy bleeding. They have uh, huge underwear that they wear. They have like special bedding that they have to have in their bed because of it. It'll last like some a week long and it's kind of like all of these things that men will say, well, if you don't want kids, just get on birth control. Or if you want less days on your period, get on birth control, where you don't understand how medicine and chemicals affect a woman's body and can produce something like fibroids. And then you have all these foods that have a lot of soy in it which <laughs> your estrogen levels. And so I told my mom yesterday, I said, why do I have to go to the store and choose between a butter that has olive oil in it and then soy free? If soy doesn't have to be in the butter, don't put it in the butter. So it's, it's about making choices once you have the information that you need to make a better choice. And some people just don't want to make the choice or they might live in an environment where those choices are limited. If I want to go to a, a store that has better options for me to eat and my family to eat, I have to drive 20 minutes outside of where I live and it shouldn't yeah. be that way. Yeah, or the, those other options aren't offered, right? Like, yeah. so I found out in 2015 that this was happening with me and the first thing that was offered for me was surgery. I've never had surgery before. Um, and so I was like, well, no, like I'm not gonna let you cut on my body, especially because even if they remove them, it doesn't mean they go away. And so for me, I was really struggling with saying, uh, and, and I recognize people have to make different choices for their lives. So that's not like, that's not like, uh, not, there's no shade to other folks. But for me, I was like, I've never had surgery before. They're telling me you can cut these things out of my body, uh, but there's no cure, there's no like full like cure that you have for them. They they can come back. Um, they could put me on medication, but it'll, and it'll shrink them. But most insurance companies will only cover the medication if you plan on getting them removed, right? And so I just kept learning. I'm like, this is not the route that I want to go, not right now. Um, and, and again, I think I was a little different because, and I, I shouldn't say different because I'm not sure how many folks have a similar experience, but I didn't have heavy, heavy periods. I didn't have whole periods. And so for me, it, that's why I didn't know because I didn't have any of those signs until I hit like 33. Um, is when I started realizing that I had cramps that I was like, wait, what is this? I never, I've never cramped before and now I'm in pain. What, what is this? And so for me, it just lied dormant. And so um, what I've talked to my doctors about, I told them, I was like, look, I'm not trying to have surgery flat out. Um, I want to try something, uh, something else, see if it works. And so there's several kind of holistic doctors I've found online um, and they say about the same thing. And you mentioned it already, changing your diet, um, going plant-based, removing lots of alcohol and sugar from your diet. Um, and 
multiple things. So I've gone kind of, I'm like 70% plant-based in my diet right now. Um, and I say 70% because that has worked well for me. Um, I, I, I found when I give myself really strict um, tunnel vision, I don't transition as well. Um, and so this has been kind of a transitioning space for me. But the challenge with this, with even going plant-based is like you mentioned earlier, so many foods have phytoestrogen in them and you don't know, right? So you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna get this alternative. I'm gonna go plant-based. I mean, my hummus and my, you know, fill in the blank and hummus um, or, you know, chick chickpeas have high phytoestrogen. And so for me, it became almost discouraging to think, I have to cut out dang near everything I'm eating. And that's something I really want uh, women to know is that, you know, plant-based is, you know, if that's how you choose to move forward, fantastic. There are definitely benefits, I think, and I've experienced with myself to plant-based, but it's another level when you have to consider, I have to look at foods that don't have any phytoestrogen in them. And there are so many foods that have phytoestrogen in them. It's not impossible, but it's really difficult and challenging in addition to being plant-based to kind of monitor, right? Um, and so I want to read you a list of some things that have, that are phyto um, estrogen plants, phyto estrogen food, foods, excuse me. Um, those things, of course, soybean and soy products, tempeh, flaxseed, oats, uh, barley, hops, lentil, yams, alfalfa, apples, carrots, pomegranates, uh, coffee, licorice, I pomegranate. <laughs> beer, um, and then you have like sesame seeds, jasmine oil. So there's just so many things that produce it. And of course they produce at different levels. Soy being what I found the highest production of phytoestrogen. It, it is a, it's a lot of removing things out of one's diet, right? Um, and so that's where I am starting. I've been able to rid myself of um, most meats. I do typically when I'm like in my house, in my space, I will do fish, maybe, or fish or seafood, maybe once a week. Um, I don't any uh, dairy products in my house, um, including ice cream, which is a hard one. Ice cream and cheese oh. are my hard ones. <laughs> I love <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> it's, it tastes fantastic. So, I mean, um, we're trying to retrain kind of mentally like what things are, are better for me um, and then the, the consistency right um, another thing that I found that worked exceptionally well and I posted it on my Instagram page and I am not a sponsor for these folks um, if they want me to do a sponsorship I am happy to do it because she will are bomb um, and they worked really well for me um, but I've been taking something called fibro defense and it's made by Crystal, is it Crystal Star is the produ production, uh, who produces it, Fibro Defense. And I take Fibro Defense when I'm not on my cycle. And so I did an experiment for about three or four months um, to where I Fibro Defense regularly. And then when my period came, I could, like, I had no cramping, my breasts weren't tender. I had no symptoms of what I had done, had happened before. So I said, let me see Luke. Um, so let me get off of it. And I didn't take it, you know, right after that. And then got back and then I started cramping on my next cycle. So I said, well, we tried it. So I kept doing it for, like I said, three or four months. Yeah. And noticed that when I got on the fibro defense, my period cramps subsided. Like I didn't have any cramping. Um, so whereas before I like, I remember one day I couldn't get out of bed. I was cramping. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, hot water bottle. Um, you know, I don't like taking medication. And so trying to avoid taking medication on top of that. Uh, but when I would take fibro defense, I saw a really big change for me in it. Um, and so that was just worth the investment. Um, other vitamins I take are Vitex. Um, there are natural herb supplements. There's, there's to help women reproductive systems, all that kind of stuff. And those things have worked well for me. Um, but it's, and, and because of that, um, that's one reason, again, why I've not chosen to have any surgery because the doctor for me said, you know, if you're not having any issues with it, right? No heavy bleeding, no global cramping most people get them removed because they're in pain. And if you're not in pain right now, um, I'm not trying to have a kid right now, I'm not trying to get pregnant. So that was, that's been the best option for me right now. Um, yeah, yeah. I know for me, um, my, mo my mother takes like 13 pills a day for different things and she's been nine years old. So at the end of the month, she'll be 67. But, you know, she grew up in Jamaica and the doctor told her mom that she won't live past one years old because of all of the things she had. And I'm always like researching and looking for a natural way so she can remove one pharmaceutical 
yeah. pill that they're basically guinea pigging on her. Like she's yeah. been a guinea pig because when you take all those meds, you're looking at a future of possible kidney damage because it's a lot going on. No, in the so many things and all you want is like some sort of relief for whatever pain you're in for whatever illness you have so i was like well let me look into like cbd oil so i've been like a guinea pig on my mom's behalf to see how it works with me as far as like what it helps and what i noticed so yeah. when my when my menstrual cycle comes i don't feel any cramps when i take it. so I've been looking at like different brands and uh, you know different strengths of the CBD oil. So I think I'll um, you know get her a bottle of that. Being that you know, I don't think medicine cures everything. I think there's always a natural remedy to yeah. something about your body that comes yeah. from the earth that should be able to help you. Now the issue is today is so many foods are GMO. So many vitamins are tampered with from overseas and shipped to the US. So you really don't know what's in it unless you're making it yourself. Yeah. Or, or you're yeah. growing it yourself. Yep. It's, that's funny. My mom always says, you know, she doesn't believe that there's nothing in the earth that can't cure anything we have, right? Um, like it's already there. Um, I, I think if it came from the earth and it's done folks millions and generations before me well, um, why would it not work in other spaces? But um, I, I just believe pharmaceutical companies make more money keeping people sick, right? If there's an actual cure for something, they lose money. Um, and so deterring people from moving to things like plants or organic things has just made a lot more money. Um, and as far as taking medication, I think for me, my, the fear has always been not only what are the side effects of what I'm taking, um, that number two, it's just curing symptoms, not the root cause of the issue. And then three, not knowing what my body chemistry, how it responds and other things. Yeah. If, if I'm mixing things, you know, what cocktail or concoction that I'm creating my body and how will those things and interact with each other, right? Because I've had three different doctors that give me three different things. They're not consulting each other. Um, right. They're just saying, Right, we're pushing this drug that we get paid by pharmaceutical companies to push, um, and when you buy it. And so, um, I, I'm, 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 I agree with you. I, my grandmother is from, well, she was from Louisiana, Louisiana, as we call it, not Louisiana. Louisiana. <laughs> from on a farm. Um, she picked cotton when she was younger, born in the 1930s, so on the, you know, telling them the depression. And so, what she grew, everything she ate. Um, and so, you know, just that lifestyle of, you know, being extremely active, growing up on a farm, growing things you ate. Um, and then we think about how we consume foods now, even in a grocery store, all the pesticides are on there, right? To keep bugs away. Um, but our bodies are ingesting that. Um, yeah. So even she would have used before, you know, she you know grew up on a farm and even in the middle of Dallas, she had this amazing garden. But the pesticides she put on her food, when she was growing them to keep bugs away, um, what were the what are the causes, side effects of those things, right? After consuming right. them, so many years and so um i'm with you Unless you were growing the things that you were consuming directly um or even the idea of buying organic i'm often leery of those labels like what is because it fda you only have to have a certain percentage of something organic in it to label it organic and it's just like no it's either organic or it's not organic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so even taking that stuff into consideration I'm glad you mentioned things around access to food. Um, mm -hmm. Where I live, there was a food desert. Um, a big one in the U.S. is in this in this city that I live in. And so I think about not having access to that. Um, what do you do? Um, I remember being in high school and girls are like, I remember even telling them how many of them were on, on birth control. What are the long-term effects of being on birth control as your body is still developing and growing? What's the impact of that on your body, right? Um, and I think people make the best decisions um, they know how to make with what the information they have. And I, and I don't fault them for that. Um, my thing is when we get better information, um, how do we begin to change and what resources am I being a part of helping to create access to these things? I'm not just, hey, do better because I told you to, but addressing those systemic issues around access to like healthier food options. Um, into the best care because, like I said, the first thing the doctor recommended for me was to go for surgery. Well, who gets paid for that? They do. Doctors paid, exactly, right? So it's in their best interest 
um, if I undergo surgery. Um, and really even, and I would specifically went to, I identified a black female doctor that's from the Caribbean, it's really intentional of wanting a black female doctor. And even in that recognizing when I asked for alternative support, you know, I was like, well, what other folks are saying? What are some holistic methods? Um, she was kind of hesitant to give me anything. And when she did, it was with skepticism. And I recognize you trained in this traditional way of, you know, feeding things or whatever, you're going to give me what you know to give me. And so, um, and so it, 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 that's me having an education, right? I recognize even with me and my privilege and my class and educational privilege, that's, that's me having my, you know, two degrees and being able to, to read through the fine print and knowing that I have options. Mm. Is that for folks that don't have the same access or education behind it to even ask, are there, are there, are there alternatives to me doing this? Yeah. Or the being, hey, you have this, you can do this immediately, right? Um, and so I, t I, I can't pretend like those things um, haven't and don't impact people's experiences with fibroids, especially Black women's experiences with fibroids. Um, also recognizing that how we're treated in hospitals, right? We're not believed. Our bodies, you mentioned being guinea pigs, our bodies since uh, the beginning of, you know, modern medicine have been test dummies for um, white male doctors, right? Thinking about enslaved African women um, being performed on with no anesthesia, just like being just, just you know, the body just being exposed to things with no um, and so I, I, I can't delete that or remove that part of this. Um, so it's such, it's such a, you know, I'm, we're talking about fibroids, but it's such a big conversation. Um, it's like, how do I not only address this personally, but communally, right? Like how are we having these conversations with each other? And well, who are the doctors that are doing great work? Like who are the doctors that are promoting this that are affordable? Because I found some nice folks and for treatment, they were charging like 300 something bucks. Like I made several consultations with people that were like, here's the whole list of me doing things. I need you on a treatment plan. And one doctor was like $3,000. And Except that's an irritation for me because if you had your own issue and you said, I wanted to take upon myself to research it and come up with something naturally to solve it. Good. Where you come in bad is if I want to give you this information and I want to educate the next person, I'm going to charge you a thousand dollars for I mean, this information. And it does it doesn't make you a good person in that light anymore because you are now trying to profit off of the fact that someone needs this information to live a better life. Just like <laughs> hospitals, just like pharmaceutical companies. And to me, I hate when people do that because now I thought I was looking to you as a helping hand. Now you're looked at as a hand that just wants my money. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so and, and again, where, where it's so deeply systemic, um, and, and I'll say this, for any doctor out there, I recognize you put in the time and the effort and the money to do it. I am not ignoring um, or dismissing the hours you took to do it. What I am saying, especially folks that share phenotypic no ethnic identity with me. I recognize too, um, like poet said, all my kinfolk ain't my skinfolk. So I'm not like, all my skinfolk ain't my kinfolk. I'm not ignoring that piece of it. But if you have information that, that can and has, if you've experienced change lives and you recognize there's a demographic of people that have increased elevated exposure to issues and then I come to you and say, hey, like, I want to do this. I'm an educator. And look, again, I'm not, again, I'm not dismissing class. I recognize I have privilege in a lot of ways. But as after a consultation, you sit there like fully honest and tell me it's $3,000 to start a plan. And you don't even have this one, you don't even have the research to show how it's impact, like this should, that has consistently impacted your, your consumers or your patients' lives. Wait, you miss $3,000 on a maybe? And then they say the insurance will cover it. Most insurance companies do not cover holistic Insurance ways. companies hate covering natural Anything. options. Anything. I, I've worked corporate jobs where after I had my second kid, they were like, if you want to go ahead and get um, your tubes tied and burnt off, we will pay for it for free. So right they're now. offering that. So I won't ever have another excuse to take maternity leave. So I won't ever have another excuse for them to pay out money while I'm out of work, not doing anything for them. And I don't think people look at it in that way. They look at it like, oh, they're going to pay for it, but why are they paying for it? What's the old saying? Don't look for, look, 
don't forget, look a gift horse in the mouth. Like it ain't just because they being nice. They ain't never right. been nice. I mean, let's just keep it a thousand. Like folks, they never just did something. Most people don't do something out of them, just do it for the kindness of their out of the kindness of their heart. And so I, so I think for me, it hit even harder when I saw these black female doctors knowing the statistics around black women in fibroids, saying we're going to charge you three hundred fifty to three thousand dollars for treatments for vitamins. You know what I'm saying? That you don't create. Um, and just to do a plan for that. And women, because out of desperation and need to, like you said, feel relief, both hand over fist, you know, giving money. I just, it does not fit, it does not sit well with me. It does not bode well with me ethically that that is the best option um, for folks to get healing. If you really saying you want healing for an entire demographic of people, like if you're really saying you're for the people, if you're really saying this, like I really, I really wonder, like, put your literally put your money where your mouth is, or take the money. That or find a way that your business that you're offering me can be paid for medically. Yeah, that can yeah. be paid for government wise. Yeah. Yep. Let me really be be strategic in saying I really want you to have access, so you can really use your insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, but that was that was you know most people every time I ask you like, well, we don't know it's. You know, it's case by case, but that. So one time, I finally asked, like, what's the what's the what's the probability that interest will cover it? And one person was finally honest and said, probably not. Right? Like that was the most honest answer I've gotten. Yeah. Uh, but one time, I, you know, this is three, four consultants trying to figure out, hey, like, what 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 plans do you have? What do you do? How do I try to avoid surgery? Uh, and and so the answer I came up with was trying to go plant based. Um, and so I mean, this is an attempt for me to figure things out and learn more about it. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is this is me giving my, you know giving me my chance, my shot at trying to figure out what can I do and how can I empower and inform other women, um, other Black women, are dealing with similar issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just so so many people out here wearing the I want to help you suit, and then you go on their link or their website. The seminar is $125. This um, boot camp is $1,000. But think about your future. If the information is so good and you are targeting people who have less than, why are you charging them money that you know they don't have? You might as well give the information to those who can't pay for it and then the company that hire you can pay you. That's where you get your money. You don't get your money banking on the people that don't have anything to begin with. And that, that needs to stop. It's, it's, so many people it's, it's, that. it's like, it's disheartening, it's infuriating, because I'm like, y'all have all this knowledge. And for, I mean, again, again I recognize school costs money. I too have student loans. <laughs> I mean, I'm not dismissing We're it. not talking about that. <laughs> but there's some things that I do, like even my work, I do pro bono because I see the value in it so much and I want folks who don't have access to have access to it. I do that. And maybe they do these things, I'm just not made aware of it, right? Maybe that is. Um, and maybe some grant organization that I should be tapping into trying to get these access to resources for folks. Um, and I'm willing to, you know, to seek out things that way. Um, but that's been the, that's been, that's been a hard card for people to swallow is um, $3,000. Like, I just, do I put, put a lien on my house? And it, it, it may yeah change um surgery is cheaper right like no different than unhealthy food is cheaper like at this point surgery is cheaper that's um, why people get into the trouble that they get into because they have cheaper options in front of you like even here in georgia i miss new york for sensible reasons mm. access unlimited salad bars unlimited healthy options if you can't make it to the grocery store you're gonna pass at least six people on the street selling fruit. Here in Georgia, chicken and fish spot, chicken spot, burger spot, barbecue. Next, not same thing, same thing, same thing. I'm just like, where are the salads at? It's in the grocery store. And it depends on what grocery store you go to. Go to, yep. Follow the produce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People here don't wanna walk. They think if you're walking, then you must, they, you you must it must be something wrong because you're walking. No, it's not, it's not a part of Southern culture. And I say Southern because, like I said, born and raised in Texas, 
um, everything is spread out. Like we, I mean, Texans pride themselves on everything being bigger, bigger and better in Texas. That means there's not things close together. Unless you live in a downtown area, which again is really expensive, mm-hmm. you don't like, you know, when I visited New York and Jersey or the place, I'm like, it's so great that I can hop on a train when I interned in DC, I can hop on the Metro and be here there. Um, but even like limiting the amount of groceries one can take on a bus, right? Like you even have a limit on what you can take on public transportation. So what does that mean for folks again around access to access to resources? If that's limited, what do you do? If you can only take three baskets or three bags on a bus with you and you're trying to feed a family of four, what do you do? Right. Just one thing after another. So I'm not deviating off of fibroids, but there's so there's so much that's intertwined. Um, and connected to that to the conversation. So, Ooh, so, so let's say I was a woman and I just found out I have fibroids. Yeah. What are like my top five things I need to do next? Yeah. Um, for me, I found out what type of fibroids do you have. Right. There are three types of fibroids folks can have, um, and the three types are submucosal, intramural, and subserosal. And they'll tell you that um in your consultation but to be clear and i say that because sometimes you could have all three different types on your uterus right like it it really depends and i say that's important because depending upon where the fibroid is it may be hindering or impacting your life in different ways right so mine are subserosal all mine thus far are subserosal and they're called and they're pedunculated meaning they're on a stalk um and so if I'm sure, of course, I'm, I know they will be able to see it, but if I have a stalk, my fibroids hanging off the stalk. And this okay. is like my stalk. And so that is easier to get to because if they're going to have surgery, they can cut it off there and they're not having to go into my uterine wall lining or my muscle, none of that. Depending on what it is though, if it, and, and if you're wanting to have kids, that'll be different for you. So the first thing I would find out is um, how many do I have? Where are they positioned? Um, and what type do I have? Those would, those would be the first three things I would want to have clear. Um, once um, the person has done that, once I did that, my next set of questions for the doctor were, um, what my doctor and myself are, what are my alternatives to just surgery? Um, like they, of course, gave me a list of medications. I've already said like, I'm not pro meds. If I can avoid it, I will um, at all costs. So what were my other alternatives for doing it? Uh, for dealing with them. And so some people have amazing YouTube videos about making like castor oil packs, which is something that I do pretty frequently. Um, like I said earlier, finding um, vitamins that uh, help with healthy reproductive systems. I mentioned fibro defense and Vitex, and so that's something I did. Um, and then the third thing for me was changing my diet. Uh, again, that was my, those are my like first three steps. Um, and now for me, it is trying to see how my body responds to it. Um, do I see a decrease? Do I do my fibroids shrink? And I think the hard part is sometimes it's a long game. Sometimes it's not the short get it over with, you know, system that most people want or I want it at least. I shouldn't speak what I want it. It is, I'm in a long game now of, you know, I've increased how much I work out. Um, I have cut out phytoestrogen foods because I, you know, recognize fibroids feed off estrogen. Um, I have changed my diet. I am, you know, uh, taking better um, better quality of vitamins that I take all those things I'm doing now um, and the long game for me now is a year from now uh, after doing this you know plant-based piece or transitioning more to plant-based to see how my body responds to it and so they do that with a couple of different things I've had vaginal ultrasounds if you can do that if your doctor's office offers that um, I would suggest getting a vaginal ultrasound um, because it allows them to see uh, the diameter of the fibroids and a better look at where they're located, that kind of thing. Um, this last time I went to the doctor, I was supposed to have a saline-induced in, uh, ultrasound, um, and it's when they um, put saline into your ears and balloons up so they can have a better kind of uh, scope of what's happening there. Mm-hmm. But I have problems with that because my fibroid is so big, it's pushing over my uterus and it's tilted my cervix over. They couldn't get the instrument in to without like me being without me crying um to even get would have that one done right but if you can have those things done uh that'd be a great next step to see you know to see how many do you have what the size of them are 
I mean, get a real understanding of what's happening with your body. And ask, like, real for real, ask questions. If nothing else, I recognize, like, people want us, like, I've had experiences where doctors try to schedule things on a tight schedule and get me in and out. And I'm like, no, like, I'm paying you. I want you to answer any and every question that I can. Um, because this is my body. And just because you have to see five other people and you don't care about me, I care about me enough to do the work to do that. And so um, after I started watching more videos and reading more, I was coming in with specific questions pertaining to me, right? Again, I'm 36, I don't have kids, I've never been pregnant. Uh, I do wanna have kids one day. And so what does it look like for me in that process? Um, and all the doctors keep saying, well, you know, if you get it removed, it makes it easier for you. Um, or I've heard of some women getting pregnant and then having complications because of that. I know you mentioned fertility earlier. It's not impossible to get pregnant. Um, there are lots of folks that say they've done naturalistic, holistic things and they've had great results from it. I know people that have had surgery and they've seen great results from that. Um, and so there is no one size kind of fits all piece of it. And I've given you like six different things kind of spread out. So I'll try to make them more concise. Um, uh, go back through, you said five. I did was ask what type of fibroids did I have, and that included doing uh, vaginal ultrasounds, saline ultrasounds, if at all possible to figure out the size, where they're located. Second thing I did was I looked for alternatives outside of medication, um, what things were also offered or available to me, um, and I made lifestyle changes, uh, cutting back on some things, trying to clear out phytoestrogen foods. If you're on birth control and you can get off of birth control, get off birth control again it is just estrogen and fibroids feed off estrogen um and now <clears throat> stages four and five are waiting for me so i'm really only at number three right now because i have to take time and see how this this lifestyle change uh you know how it impacts my life um and so that's I, i'm realistic i can give you three good ones um in the process i like that and i like the fact that you don't give any information on something you haven't tried so a lot of people like to throw information at people and just like well have you tried it have you seen any results um have you ever tried like yoni pearls yeah i did actually i've okay. done that before um and i had some things that came out with it um but the second time i had an adverse reaction to it and it really honestly was probably me and how fast i was trying to do it again because what i do recognize is when i receive information like shoot you have fibroids and they're multi like they're multiplying my immediate response was how do i get rid of them quickly and so i think yeah. that's where I, I went wrong i've done yoni pearls i've not done yoni steams i've um heard about them i've done one they're amazing like, hey, it, ma okay. it makes your vagina feel like a uh, dental cleaning <laughs> oh my goodness i feel like a spearmint person but it's really it's really good <laughs> yeah it's really fun like them I, well she she has her own company and she does them and then COVID hit so I couldn't go in um, mm -hmm. that. I had done any pearls and then saw some things like things come out um which sounds really weird some things some tissue um cells that stuff kind of stuff come out but didn't yeah. do it long enough to see uh the impact um I'm not gonna be like yeah I got it all and you should just try it uh yeah. again see what's in there because not everybody's body responds well to things and that's something I dealt right. with a second time I did it my body did not respond well. So I said, well, let's just halt it, pump brakes, a little bit, you're going too fast. Um, and then uh, try it again. And so that's something that's on my list when I get back into town to try again. Yeah, and also like, if there's any women trying different things naturally to see if they work, write down like your results. Keep a track <laughs> daily of what's happening with you because you don't want to be in that doctor's office and be like, you know what? Um, I tried this and let me remember what happened or was it this? You want to make sure you know what's going on with your body. Yeah, like I said with the thyroid, I did it for like four months first. But I was like, okay, let's try it on, let's try it off, let's try it on, let's try it off. And I was like, oh, this is, my body responding well to this. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing I've heard people say, and I, and I think it's a great just kind of habit is even not trying to do everything at one time, like right when you're changing your diet to remove, to see, all right, how's my body responding to this thing I've removed or if you've added supplements or vitamins, how am I responding to the vitamins I've taken? Um, I don't know, I, for me, I don't think I do everything in just one clean swoop. I like to say, all right, let's, let's see if this works. Let's see how my, no different than like hair or, or skin. I'm not putting every brand new product that comes out on my face. Right. Um, I need to see what happens first time I Listen, I had to stop myself because Amazon.com in this quarantine right now, I said, 
Ooh, carrot oil. Ooh, turmeric oil. Ooh, what is this? A sunflower seed oil? Let me see the benefits. And I'm just like, Chantal, stop. You can only put so many things on your face at one time. If it, if it, if it, like things like me, the more stuff I have, I go, to, like, I don't use. Oh, look at this hair growth treat that I use to conceal me for a couple days, and then find right. something else. I don't stick with that long enough to see that benefits are impacted. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. good. Well, this is good for information. I'm glad that uh, you got so, to share it, and even down to like the three types. I didn't know there were three types. Mm-hmm. So that's good. Um, mm-hmm. I just I hope more women. <laughs> Yeah, like more women need to be okay with getting to know their bodies and, you know, I don't feel right today. What doesn't feel right? And not being ashamed of having the discussion because I think there are more women that have fibroids and don't even know they have fibroids. And they say that because you have symptoms. Yeah, and I'm just like, go, go check. And I was in my 20s not wanting someone to be all up in my vagina whether you had a, a degree or not like I don't I feel like that's a, a invasion of me but being a woman period is an invasion whether you have babies whether you have this and one thing after you have kids is you don't care who you gotta like open up to after that because there's so many nurses and doctors coming in seeing you naked and you're yeah, like the yeah. 200th woman of the day that they didn't saw. And it's kind of like, whatever you need to do to get this kid out of me or fix it, fix it. And yeah. it's all about understanding that. And even the last episode that I did with the lady talking about breast cancer, there's a lot of people that don't want to feel their breasts for lumps. And it's kind of like, if you don't want to feel your breast for lumps, who's going to feel your breast for lumps? Are you going to yeah. wait for that one appointment each year for some for a doctor to feel your breast? It doesn't make sense. So I'm all about um, women getting more in touch with their bodies. And thank you for sharing. Can you tell the people yeah. where to find you? Yeah, so on Instagram, it's at Black Girls with Fibroids. Um, you can find me there. Um, I also, my consulting company is EnduranceConsulting.com. So it's my website is EnduranceConsultingLLC.com. And then I'm launching something called Diaspora Dialogue. I just got that I'm working on my website right now. And it really is a space for folks of shared ethnic and racial identity to have conversations about issues amongst us, right? Um, you mentioned like learning your body. Some of that stems from older women or older generations not talking about body. Why do we do that? Why do we not share what's happening with our bodies with each other? Why is everything a secret? <laughs> exactly, right? And so, but, but giving, so for me, it's giving the space for that. So Diaspora Dialogues. So D Y A S P O R A D Y A L O G S. I mean, of course, I'll share them with you, the links with you. Those things. But those are kind of the three places that I am. Um, and so, again, for me, the platform on Instagram for a Black Girl with Fibroids, uh, Black Girls with Fibroids, really is to just connect with people, share my story, and really to do what, you know, to remove this kind of stigma around being quiet and hush hush about what's happening with our bodies. Um, is if you're not asking questions, folks are doing whatever they want to do to your body, or you just taking things and not being, you know, not investing while they're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, but wanting yeah. to space where folks can share about these things openly when destigmatize um, this idea of not talking about um, our reproductive organs, our reproductive system. And so, just nothing else to try to help build solidarity around those things. So, those are kind of three places that I exist. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said, um, Black Girls with Fibroids. I asked for a dialogue, which is my new baby, and then endurance consulting. I love it. And and lastly, but never least, I think um, people today and families, you might have dads with daughters or mothers with daughters. We have to stop pushing birth control on teen girls and put more confidence, more awareness, more self-respect, because I've never taken birth control. I'm 33 with two kids and I've never taken birth control. My mom had five of us. I was the only girl on the last one. And she's never pushed birth control on me. I just always, from what I've seen with my brother, saw the other side of what males do when it comes to girls. And I was just like, well, I'm not dealing with a man if he does X, Y, and Z. So for me, it's kind of like, I was the open and shut 
store for my body. And I was just very selective with the people I chose to deal with in a sexual sense. And you do not need chemicals being put in a child's body in order to prevent reproduction because our bodies are supposed to do that naturally. And these, these companies try to play God. They try to, you know, train your body to not do what it's supposed to do. And we back, we get the backfire from what women deal with. And um, yeah, I really yeah. back to change. It wasn't good for me. I started taking birth control in college. Um, mm-hmm. And then, again, because I just didn't know, like I didn't know, um, although we had had some great conversations, my mom had shared a lot with me. Um, that piece of just didn't talk much about. And yeah. so I was going to friends that I knew who had been on it for like years and years. And, you know, had I known now that, uh, it's all that estrogen could have impacted my body. I would have made different choices, um, right? I'm offering folks making the best decision they have, what they know, but let's increase what you know, and then you have a better making better decisions. And so that's what I'm hoping to do. Love it. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Cozy Moon Podcast.